Good morning, family. Welcome to another worship service of Bible Baptist Church. It's so good to have you with us this morning. We'd also like to say good morning to our family and friends that are visiting and worshiping with us via live stream. This is a day that the Lord has made, and may he help all of us to be able to rejoice and to be glad in it. I'm so thankful for God, he remains the same in all these still changing times and tremendous adjustments for our lives. And he has been the eternal constant. Uh, he is the anchor for our soul. And so let's continue to rely upon him, trust him, and have our confidence in him. I'd like to remind you also that on Wednesdays, right here in the sanctuary from 10 o'clock to 11, our weekly prayer, testimony, and Bible study. Feel free to join us. We're doing a series on fasting, and we're looking at all of the ways in the Bible, reasons for fasting. So come and join us. A uh, real practical study and also a time of praying, praying for our church, praying for our country, our, our world. And then testimonies. It's always good to hear, as Paul says, a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. But no matter what we're going through, we can't forget God is still working. God is still moving in our life. And it's always encouraging to hear the testimonies of the saints. I also want to remind you that the youth group Bible study, last week I believe 17 youth have registered for the youth group Bible study. Uh, the youth committee has chosen that uh, because of these times to return to the fundamentals of the faith. And so our young people will be studying, going right through back to the basics of Bible, basics of uh, doctrine. Uh, but it'll also be a time not only for Bible study, but also for games and other activities. And so if you're interested, please contact the church office and the church office will direct you to the youth committee. And uh, I believe that they're still ordering the material. But as of last week, 17 youth have signed up. And so uh, and if you know of someone uh, it doesn't have to be a member of the church, uh, they're also looking for youth in the committee, a community to be a part of this wonderful, wonderful Bible study. And understand that the marriage ministry kicked off with a great virtual game night. Understand they had a wonderful time, and so you'll be hearing about more announcements from our marriage ministry and be listening for that. I want to also ask you to continue to pray for our church uh, let's not forget to pray for those that uh, we haven't seen. Let's uh, particularly remember our seniors, uh, members of Bible Baptist, and also our single members, those that live alone that you haven't seen. Let's make sure that we call. Let's make sure that we uh, let them know we love them, we, we miss them, and we're concerned uh, for them. These are all the announcements that we have at this time. And so we're going to ask Minister Sims to come and lead us in prayer. We have special music and we'll get into our study uh, this morning. God bless you. Mm. 
May we bow our head for a word of prayer. Our Father, Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Lord, we thank you for today, Lord, a day that we have never seen before, Lord, and truly a day that we will never see again. Lord, we thank you for our life, our health, our strength. We thank you for the use and activities of our limbs. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for you said in your word that we live, we move, we have our being. Your grace is sufficient for us, Lord. We're so thankful, Lord, for when our strength is weak, Heavenly Father, Lord, you said through you our strength is made perfect, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for last night's lying down and this morning rising up, Lord. You kept us all last night, Lord, even when we didn't even know we was even in the world, Lord. You kept the thief and the robber, Lord, out of our home. So for that, we want to say thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you, Lord, for having, for giving us the right mind to come out to your house of worship just one more time. Lord, to sing Zion songs and to praise your holy and righteous name, knowing that your name alone is worthy to be praised. Lord, you said, from the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. You also said in your word, Lord, that let the redeem of the Lord say so, Heavenly Father, Lord. So we just thank you, Lord, for all things, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for forgiving us of our sins, Lord. You said in your word, Lord, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, Lord. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. You said in your word, Lord, that thou hast kept me alive, that I shall not go down to the pit, Lord. You told us to sing unto the Lord all ye praises of his and give thanks at the remembrance of your holiness. For your anger only endureth for a moment. But your favor is light that we may endure for a night, Lord, but joy is going to come in the morning, Lord. So, Lord, we're just praying for peace right now, Lord. We're praying for joy, Heavenly Father. We're praying for love, Lord. So many of us, Lord, are just, we're so confused in our mind, Lord. Sometimes we just don't feel like doing certain things, Heavenly Father, Lord. But you said in your word, Lord, that you will give us peace, Lord, that will surpass all of our understanding, Lord, if we keep our minds stayed on you and that trust in you, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, the one who hung, bled, and died on the cross of Calvary for our sins. You were buried. You rose again on the third day. You coming back with all power, heaven and earth is in your hands, Lord. Lord, we come praying for our children, Lord. We come praying for our marriages, Heavenly Father. Lord, bind us up in love, Lord, that one can't fall without the other, Heavenly Father. Lord, it feels like suicide is just, is just running rampant in our society, Lord. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you may, you may change their mind, Lord, that you may cover us, Lord, with your blood, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this church family at large, Heavenly Father. Lord, remind us to check up on one another, Lord. Remind us to keep loving one another, Heavenly Father. Uh, Lord, we thank you for Pastor Lavender, Lord. Continue to strengthen him when he is weak, build him when he is torn down, prop him up on every lean aside, Lord. He's going through the series about revival, Lord. Help us to be revived, Lord. Help us to be renewed, Heavenly Father. Lord, stir up the gift that is already in us, Heavenly Father. So, Lord, we thank you. We love you. We be careful to give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. And if anyone doesn't know you, Lord, in the free part of their sins, Lord, whether it be here in this building or watching on live stream, Lord, may this be the day of salvation. Lord, we love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tell me what do you do when you've done all you can then? Seems like it's never enough. And what do you say when your friends turn away and you're all alone, alone? Tell me what do you give when you give in your all and seems like you can't make it through 
Well, you just stand when there's nothing left to do. You just stand or watch the Lord see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stand. Tell me, how do you handle the guilt of your past? Tell me, how do you deal with the shame? And how can you smile when your heart has been broken and feel with pain, feel with pain? Tell me, what do you give when you're giving your all and seems like you can't make it through? Child, you just stand when there's nothing left to do. You just stand. And wonders the Lord see you through. Yes, after you've done all you can, you just stand and be sure. Be not entangled in that bondage again. You just stand and endure. God has a purpose. Yes, God has a plan. Tell me when you've done all you can and it seems like you can't make it through. Child, you just stand. You just stand. Stand. Don't you dare give up. Through the storm. Stand through the rain. Through the hurt, jet through the pain. Don't you bow and don't you bend. Don't give up, no, don't give in. Hold on, just be strong. God will step in, and it won't be long, no, after you've done all you can, after you've done all you can, after you've gone through the hurt. After you've gone through the pain, after you've gone through the storm, after you've gone through the rain, you prayed and cried, you prayed and cried. You prayed and you cried, prayed and cried, oh my. After you've done all you can, you just stand. Oh, oh, oh. you.
Amen. I would like to thank the music ministry, those that are representing our choir, men's choir, youth choirs, adult choirs, through this time, everybody with their comfort. And I appreciate the music. Thank you so much. That's what we do, though. We stand in the Lord, in the power of his might. And we are depending upon his power and his strength. Let's take our Bibles this morning as we come to the final message of this series on revival. The revival of Josiah in Judah and Jerusalem. Second Chronicles chapter 35. We purposely have extended the Passover because of this time of season. And we've looked at different aspects of the Passover. Lord willing, I want to invite you this coming Friday, our Good Friday service. It'll be an hour, 12 noon to 1 o'clock. And it'll just be a scriptural reading and special music during that time. And then, Lord willing, next Sunday, we'll focus on the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But Second Chronicles 35, and I'm going to read verse 1 and verse 11. Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem. And they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. Then verse 11, and they killed the Passover and the priests sprinkled the blood from their hands and the Levites flayed them. Just by way of review, we have focused on Josiah becoming king at eight years old. At 16, he begins to seek after the Lord and at 20, he comes away with a whole different outlook. His worldview has changed. It was an encouragement to me and hopefully to you that I will never ever spend time with God and be the same. I have to come away changed. I can't remain the same. And that's exactly what he does. And so the first thing he does is he wants to refine the land. He removes it of its impurities. You and I said that if I want revival in my life, God is a holy God. And he said, be holy because I am holy. And if I want revival, then I'm going to have to remove the impurities in my life. Those things that I know are not pleasing to God. I'm doing things that God told me not to do. And I'm not doing things that he told me to do. And I simplify that way, and I remove the impurities in my life. The next thing he does is he repairs the house of God. Again, the house is not mystical or magical, but it represents the presence of God. It is the temple. God says that right there above the mercy seat, above the cherubim, I will meet with you. I will be your God. You will be my people. And so it would be God's glory that would shine in the temple. It represented his presence. And we said, now the church, where two or three are gathered together, we are the temple of God. Our bodies are the temple, the body personal, as well as the body united. And I must do everything I can to repair the house. I need to, and I'm thankful for those who spend time in God's house and making sure that it serves, that it's always clean, that it's always repaired. Uh, we, had a, we had a flood this week in one of the offices, and, and, and as soon as the flood, uh, they, they had people to come, our trustees had uh, those to come out to clean it up and to, and to make sure that it's right. And, and that's an attitude. That's an attitude. It must be the same for ourselves. Let's do everything we can with our bodies, our body temple. I'm thankful for our medical team that's doing everything to help us and focus on our health. And, and we know this is not our permanent body, but while we have it, let's do everything we can. We find also that not only does he refine the land and repairs the house, he recovers the book of God. He recovers 
the law of God. Hilkiah finds it, he gives it to the king, and they read it, and they begin to reform their life based upon what God's word says. If I want revival and you want revival, we're going to have to recover the book of God in our life. Our devotional life, our reading of God's word, our studying it, our memorizing it and committing it into obedience and practice, that is the only way that we're going to be able to get revival. If you've studied it historically, you'll see that anytime there's a revival, there's always a renewed interest, a renewed purpose in the word of God. And then finally, he restores the Passover. The Passover represented the forgiveness of sins, the atonement of sins. And we don't want to get to the place where we forget the Passover in our life, as Peter says, that, that, that time, the Lord's table, whereby he says you forget it, and, and then all of a sudden it loses its purpose in our life. And then I begin to forget about how much I've been forgiven. We looked at the woman who had the alabaster box, and Jesus says that uh, she loves much because she was forgiven much. I'll get to the place where I think I'm not that bad. I'm certainly not someone who keeps committing the Big Ten. And because of that, I'm okay. But I have to remember that I'm only here by God's grace and mercy, just like everybody else. And I have to remember that God shed his blood for the forgiveness of my sin. And so we focus on the Passover. We looked at its historical significance. And then last time we focused on the firstborn and we showed that the firstborn in Egypt, that it was the blood, that when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And as a result of that, the firstborn, he says, the firstborn are mine. The priests represent the firstborn in Israel. And then Jesus himself is called Mary's firstborn son. And how all of that pointed to the firstborn. We want to close that out this morning with a focus just on the blood of the Passover itself. The blood. Again, verse 11 says, And they killed the Passover, and the priests sprinkled the blood from their hands, and the Levites flayed them. I am fascinated by the science of hematology. Those that spend their life, science work, simply studying the blood and the purpose of the blood. I'm indebted to Dr. M. R. Dehan, who has written a classic called The Chemistry of the Blood, a book that uh, you find was written back in the 1940s. There's this is a book in my library. If you, can, if you can find the book, if it's still in print, please get the book. Please read it and study. You won't agree with, with all of M. R. DeHaan's politics and uh, some of the other aspects of his life. But uh, as a doctor, as a physician, as a scientist, but also a theologian, he does a a masterful job in the chemistry of the blood showing the scientific aspects of the gospel. The scientific aspects of the gospel. He lays out the chemistry of the blood and he shows the significance of the chemistry of the blood in our body and the blood that Jesus shed and the church body. It is amazing. You will not regret that study from M.R. Dehan, but I am indebted to him because there's so much about the blood that I don't know. But I have been able to jot down some things. I'm going to read some quotes from his book. He says that the Bible is a book of blood and a bloody book. It is a book of blood and it is a bloody book. He goes on to say the only thing that gives life to our teaching and uh, power to the word of God is the fact that it is the blood that is the life and power of the gospel. But think about this, 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 this fist size organ that expands and contracts a hundred thousand times per day 
pumping five to six quarts of blood throughout our body, which amounts to 2,000 gallons of blood is pumped through our bodies every single day. As the heart beats, it pumps blood through a system of blood vessels called the circular system. The vessels are elastic tubes that carry blood to every part of the body. He says blood is essential. In addition to carrying flesh or fresh oxygen from the lungs and nutrients to your body's tissue, it also takes the body's waste products, including carbon dioxide, away from the tissues. This is necessary to sustain life and promote the health of all the body's tissues. So not only does the blood serve as a purpose to promote the oxygen and the flow through all the tissues of the body, sustaining life, but it also removes all of the waste from the body as well. Isn't that amazing? Only God can do that, and yet... It symbolizes the life-giving blood of Jesus Christ and also how he removed the sin from our lives. And he goes on and on and on to show the scientific aspects of this work of hematology and how it affects the gospel message and the spiritual significance of blood and particularly the blood of Jesus in our life. Let's do sort of a panoramic focus from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And let's, let's just take this limited amount of time and, and, and let's rehearse and let's focus about the blood. Let's start in the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 and, and verse 7. We find that man is not only made of material, but he's also made of immaterial. For the text says that, that God formed man of the dust of the ground and he breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. What you'll find through the sacred texts of the word of God that there is a true real connection between the blood and the soul you'll find that God bring, uh, breathes the breath of life and man becomes a living soul. But you'll see that the verses are interchangeable between soul and blood and life in the soul, but life also in the blood. So much in so that, that there's some theologians that believe that somehow maybe the soul, that the blood contains the soul. That's amazing. When God breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul, that this also included the circular system and the blood that flows through our veins. It is the life-giving blood that God has created in all of us. We know this also because when we come to Genesis chapter 4, in verses 9 through 10, we see the first recorded murder. And as this murder is committed, God, who always wants us to take responsibility for our actions, will generally use a series of questions. Not that God does not know, but the questions simply are so that I will know what I have done. He says to Adam, where are you? You don't think God knew where Adam was? But he wanted Adam and Eve to know that they are in a different place than they were before. He says to Cain, and the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? That phrase is often used about our responsibility to all humanity, where God says that we are to love our neighbor as ourself. And so humanity, yes, I am my brother's keeper in that I am responsible to love my neighbor as myself. The whole uh, parable of the good Samaritan who finds a man on the road half dead 
And he extends to him immediate, extended, and long-term care. Jesus said, this is what it means to love your neighbor. But he says to Cain, where is your brother? God knew where he was, but he wanted Cain to come face to face with this killing. He goes on to say, and he said, what hast thou done? Listen to this. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Helping us to understand that the soul continues to live outside of the body, that when I die and when you die, I don't come to a cessation of life. I just uh, transition to another form of existence without the body. And that's why pastors, we, we give that message at the in- interment of, of death. For as much as Almighty God has seen fit to take this person's soul, we commit this body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But we look forward to the blessed hope when the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain at the coming of the Lord shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Because we want to send the message that the soul continues to live. He tells Cain, Your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. I often wonder with the murders of our country and the murders every day in America, the protests that's going on right now, all these people being killed, all that blood that's shed. I wonder about these cries that that are extending up to God. He says, your brother's blood. It cries out. Why? Because it is the soul and the life of the flesh that is in the blood. So much and so that kosher literally means fit. Fit. Kosher means fit. Fit for consumption. In Israel, based upon the Old Testament, The preparation of the food was significant. God had given dietary laws to them, and they still maintain those dietary laws. And so kosher, fit, fit for consumption. But there's something specific about the meat, not only in the preparation, but how it is slaughtered because of what God's word and the preciousness of blood. Genesis chapter 9 and verses 3 and 4. He tells, God tells his people about eating blood. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. After sin, the diet changed. Herb yielding seed was the first diet. After sin, however, God said everything. But as you eat the meat, according to verse 4, but flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall you not eat. Israel would take that seriously. And the preparation, kosher, fit for consumption. But not only in the preparation, but how the animals are slaughtered is supervised. To make sure that when it is presented to me for consumption, there is no blood. Because it is the life of the flesh is in the blood. Now keep this in mind now. The life of the flesh is in the blood. But not only because of the animal consumption, but 
but also as the value of the blood, not only that's flowing through, through animal veins, but also through human veins. God puts a premium on it. In Genesis chapter 9 and verses 5 through 6, we see the beginnings of human government or capital punishment. It is unjust today because it is not issued out fairly and properly. And usually those that are poor, people of color, minorities, and others who don't have the finances often end up with capital punishment. But what God does is it, he puts a value upon life. Someone says, well, don't we perpetuate and lower the value of life by taking a life for the life. But I want us to be thinking now about redemption. Life for life is what Jesus will do. But here's what we find in Genesis. And surely your blood of your lives will I require it. The hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Verse 6 tells us, whosoever sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. God is saying that that blood is precious. It represents life. It represents the soul. And because it does that, and because man is created in the image of God, man has dignity. Man has liberty. Man has freedom. Man has rights. And no other, listen to me carefully, no other belief is going to maintain this than the belief that God created man in his own image. That is the highest dignity that you can place. The highest dignity is not the color of my skin. That's God's sovereignty. He says the Ethiopian can't change his skin color. How I came into the world, the color of my skin, that's God's sovereignty. God likes diversity. Yes, he does. But it is in the soulish part, this part where the life of the flesh is in the soul or it is in the blood because man was created in the image of God. It will not be maintained if we don't maintain this belief. Because evolution just simply says that I'm only in the gradual process, the gradual process. Only difference of me and a termite is the gradual process. And just like termites, those that believe that, and you'll see in his history, there's been all kinds of extermination because of that belief. But he says that man is created in the image of God. And because man is created in the image of God, there's a value on that blood. So much and so that if you take a life unjustly, your life will be taken. You shed a man's blood, your blood will be shed. Why? Because this blood is precious. It is in the Levitical system, the priest system, that we begin to see more and more about the blood and atonement. But it's all tied up to the blood of life and the soul, that, that it is the blood that actually redeems the soul, gives life to the soul. And we see this in Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, as the priests are are executing their, their office. As the priests are executing the office, here's what the text says. For the life of the flesh is in what? In the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh 
atonement for the soul. That's powerful. The word atonement, basically, Baker's Theological Dictionary has given us a brief, very brief definition of atonement. God's way back to himself. That God has provided a way back to himself. That God has provided reconciliation. God has provided the atonement. A way back to himself. And God has done so by way of the blood. Now, remember what we said about the firstborn. Why the animals? Why the animal blood? The animals had to be those that were offered in the sacrifice. They all pointed to the lambs that were sacrificed, the goats that were sacrificed. All simply were pointing to. They were concealed in the old, revealed in the new about the Lamb of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They were just a type of him. But the lamb had to be without blemish. The lamb had to be uh, without spot or wrinkle because it pointed to the impeccability of Jesus Christ. The laying on of hands of the lamb was to identify, to sort of symbolically transfer my sin to the sin of the lamb. The placing of my hand on the head of the lamb was to take my knowledge of sin and transfer it to the lamb who literally knew no sin. Literally. The lamb knows nothing about human sin. That's all symbolical, pointing to Jesus. Well, the Bible says that he knew no sin, but he became sin for us, that that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So they would slay the lamb and identify with the lamb, placing the hand upon the head, slay the lamb, shed that blood, and that blood would cover sin. Just covered. Wouldn't take it away, just covered it. There would be a remembrance, though, every year. And every year, there would be what would be called, as we hear today, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, where atonement was made upon the altar, and it would be the blood of the Lamb that atoned for sin, to give a way back to God from my sin. That's amazing. But all of it pointed to the atonement of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we come then to the book of Matthew in the New Testament. In chapter 26, Jesus is preparing for his death. The lamb is preparing to die. And in Matthew 26, verses 17 through 19, What do we find him doing? The same thing that Josiah was doing. They are preparing the meal for the Passover. Now, the first day of the feast of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying unto him, where were thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master said, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them and they made ready the Passover. Now this will be the last time that Jesus will eat the Passover meal with his disciples. But I find it amazing that it is during this time, this time right now, this time this week, that he is preparing for the Passover. Wow. 
Josiah will restore it because the people had forgotten about it. They neglected the atonement. They neglected the blood. But here Jesus with his disciples. But something different is going to happen now. Because remember in the Passover, the lamb was a type of Jesus. The blood serves only as a type of Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. It only covered it. So year after year after year, we go through the ritual. We slay the lamb. We identify with the lamb. The blood is shed on the altar. It serves as an atonement, a way back. Here Jesus is eating that meal, the seven-day feast of unleavened bread. The first day he's eating that, and it is this Passover time. But there's going to be a change, something new that will happen regarding the atonement. Sin will no longer be covered. Sin will now be taken away. And so notice what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. He says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. He blessed it, he broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body. And he took the cup. And he gave thanks. And gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it. For this is my blood. Of the New Testament. Which is shed for many. For the remission of sins. Now I don't want us to move away too quickly from that word remission of sin. Remission. The word remission literally means in the language to send it back. To send it back. That it is no longer held against you. That's what it means. He says that this, what we're doing, is representing my body, that bread. This cup that we drink is representing my blood. It is now serving for a new covenant, a new testament. Sin was covered in the old, but in the new I'm sending the sin back. It's going back. The sin no longer will be held against you anymore. All this is new, he says. It's a new covenant, a new testament. And that's why when John, in John's gospel, referring to this in chapter 1 and verse 29, he knows, he knows that Jesus, that all in the old is representing Jesus. The lamb represented Jesus. That, that the lamb, the, the, the atonement, sin was only covered. But now when he sees Jesus, he knows him. Says the next day that John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. I want to ask you, how can we forget this? That the very sin that we have, that we're born with, that our father was born with, our mother was born with, and they father and mother, and they father and mother, and they father and mother, and they father and mother. There's always a remembrance of sin. But Jesus' blood, he shed his blood. He sacrificed his body for you and me so that you don't have to die, and you don't have to die, and I don't have to die anymore. My sin is no longer covered. My sin is sent back. 
It is taken away. He says the remission of my sin. So you see as a church. He said this do in remembrance of me. We cannot neglect. He said this is why some are sick. This is why some die. Because we neglect it. We had some students, some people come from Word of Truth. That's Justin's church he comes from. I had the honor of preaching there last year. You notice that when they come here during the communion, they raise that cup. Thank you, Jesus. That was new for us. We never said that. We never did that. But I do it now. Because I realize what it represents. So thank you, Jesus. As we eat this bread, thank you, Jesus. As we drink this cup, thank you, Jesus. Because it's only by grace that I'm saved. Took my sin away. And so Pauline theology. Paul has written the majority of the New Testament. And in his epistles, we see this idea of, of the blood and the remission, sending it back, and, 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 and how I benefit from it. In the Romans chapter 3 and 23 through 25, Paul says in his theology regarding this, he knows this as an Old Testament scholar. He knows what Jesus represents. He knows what his blood, he's inclusive of himself. He's inclusive of all of us, all of us. He says, for all have sinned and we come short of the glory of God. I always illustrate this by Niagara Falls. I love to go to Niagara Falls. I've probably been there 12, 13 times. I, in fact, I've seen it when it's frozen. I've been there in the wintertime. If you've been there at night, you see how they put the lights on it. It's amazing. You sit there. You sit, you, it's like when we grew up, we had this Christmas tree, silver, and we had that little light, and it was spinning around, and we'd be sitting there as kids. Man, the tree is green. Wow, it's yellow. Oh, it's red. It's green again. It's yellow. It's red. And we'd be fascinated by that. And that's how it is on the falls. They put the lights on at night. But the one thing, you're on the American side or the Canadian side, and then you can see the American side. So all of us, we, we go, we're going to take a trip, and we're going to jump across. Now, some of us are athletes. We're very athletic. And I guarantee you, some of us are going to jump farther than the rest of us. But one thing I can tell you, we all going to fall short. And it's the same thing with morality. We know some good people. We even think sometimes we're good. But we're not good enough to satisfy the righteousness of God. So he says, for all have sinned. And guess what? We've come short of the glory of God. He goes on to say in verse 24, listen to this. Being justified though, freely, by his grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He says, whom God, listen to this, has set forth to be a propitiation. Here it is. Through faith in what? His blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Here's what Paul says that first of all, all have sinned and we fall short of the glory of God. We could not save ourselves and so the eternal lamb came into the world all the way from the foundation of the world. He came into the world. He sacrificed his body and he shed his blood. So now he says, we have been bought. He says, you're redeemed. 
He purchased us with his blood. Salvation is free, but it's not cheap. It costs the very blood of Jesus Christ. He says, you've been redeemed, you've been purchased. He says that you have propitiation. That means that we have appeased God's wrath. He was going to say, we've been saved from wrath through him. That because of our sins, we deserve hell. Because of our sins, we deserve condemnation. But we have been justified. We have been redeemed. We have been purchased. We have been, the, the wrath of God has been appeased. He says, and he's also sent that sin back. He sent it back because God, his forbearance, his forbearance means that God did a pause. God did a restraint. God held back. God had patience with me because of the blood of Jesus Christ. It is the blood of Christ that God's forbearance is on me. That his wrath is held back. Because of that blood of Jesus Christ. He noticed, he says, it is the faith in his blood. In Romans 5, in verses 8 through 9, Pauline theology goes on and he says that we have been justified, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Isn't it amazing to know when I'm out there doing and not even thinking about God, I don't know God, I don't love God, but yet he loves me. And the only reason why I love him is because he first loved me. He loved me while I'm a sinner. Christ having died for me. Verse 9 says, but much more being now justified by what? By his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him. God now declares me not guilty. Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm declared not guilty because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 and verse 7 tells me I'm forgiven. By the blood of Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Forgiveness means that God no longer holds it to my account anymore. I may be suffering consequences for my choices. Sin always has consequences. So I may be in the consequential stage of my sin, but make no mistake, if I've confessed this sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. That means he remembers it no more. He throws it, as the song says, in the sea of forgetfulness. He remembers it as far as the east is from the west. But I remember it. And often that's what keeps me from my victory. Paul, looking at his own life and knowing that he has persecuted Christians, he has been supervising Christians. You notice in his letters, he keeps bringing it up. He keeps talking about it. But when he gets to the end of his life, he says, you know what? I'm forgetting those things that are behind. And right now, I'm going to press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. So much and so that often our past robs us of future victories. I can't get the victory because I'm still stuck in the past. When God has forgiven me for those things that I have done, I might have consequences for them. But I can't let them keep me from the mark of the prize. I want to end with this sort of Petrine theology, Peter is some kind of character because he, think about it, in the 12 that Jesus called. He prayed all night before he called the 12. One of them in Judas for 30 pieces of silver, which was the price of blood, those that gave him the money, he wanted to give it back. They now become the moral authorities and say, we can't take that money. That's blood money. 
You gave it to me. That's blood money. But Peter, he doesn't betray Jesus, but he does deny him. Imagine this. Peter, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you go. Peter, before the cock crows thrice, you deny me. I often think even though it's been ordained that Judas would betray, if Judas had waited three days, but he killed himself, which is often the conversation we have with loved ones and people in council if they're talking about suicide. What's tomorrow going to be like? How do you know that joy won't be in the morning? What about next week? We have a member of our church, praise God, who was at that point. And he's ready to take his life. But his daughter was in the next room so he wants to muffle the sound. So he grabs her sweater. And, the, and her smell made him change his mind. And he often says, now, Pastor, what would I have done? There was no coming back from that. No coming back from that. Peter denies Christ. But post-resurrection, he has a conversation. Jesus said, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times he asked him that. Peter followed Jesus through the trial. He denied him. Aren't you one of them? I, I don't even know this man. Your speech deceives you. I, don't, I was not with him. I don't know him. Surely you're one of them. I don't know who he is. And he stands back and he sees. And he witnesses. Post-death, burial, and resurrection, we got a different Peter. Peter looks back. And one of the words that he uses throughout his epistles is the word precious. It is a word that simply means valuable. That it's much to steam. You can't put a price on it. And one of the contexts is he uses the word is Jesus' precious blood. He says, for as much as you know, that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from our vain manner of life received by tradition of our fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish, without spot. Peter said, I denied him. Denied him through the trial, forsook him during the death while he was shedding his blood. But what I now know, that blood, you can't put a price on it. That blood is so costly. You don't have enough. That blood is esteemed so high that all I can say is that blood is precious. Father, we thank you so much for your word today. That your word is true. We thank you, Father, for your precious blood. Thank you as we've gleaned the Passover, and there's so much more. We did not exhaust this, but Father, we, we now have enough to meditate upon. 
To realize that that which is in the old was concealed is revealed in the new. That, 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 that the atoning blood, the atoning lambs and goats and bulls, all that was for and pointed to what John said when he saw Jesus. Behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. I'm, I'm thankful, Father, that sin was covered, but I'm thankful today for the new covenant, for the remission of sin. That through faith in your blood, my sin is sent back. I've been redeemed. That the propitiation and God's forbearance that he holds back on me because he's just and righteous. I deserve his wrath. But I'm saved from wrath because now I too am washed in the blood of the Lamb. I'm so thankful for faith and belief. Yet there's still many that don't know you. And if there are those who are listening to the sound of my voice and they've never ever trusted Jesus as Savior. All they have to do is say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I believe that you died for my sins. That you're buried, you rose again the third day. Come into my life and save me. It is with the heart that man believeth unto righteousness. It is with the mouth that confession is made unto salvation. Save that soul that is seeking you today in Jesus' name. And now, Father, as we leave this place, again, help us to be mindful of the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us. Help us to practice your presence and remember your promise. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. Amen. God bless you. God keep you. Ushers will dismiss you from back to front. Please follow their instruction. We're still wanting everybody to stay as safe as possible. Make sure a mask are on. Wash your hands as you leave, hand sanitize. Be mindful of the person in front of you and behind you. God bless you.